So what do we get in our down payment? In the fourth administration, Jesus had the spirit without measure. How much was that? All that there was available at that time. But the great mystery had not yet been revealed, right? When did the things of the great mystery come into legal effect? Pentecost. And that upgrade includes more than what Jesus had in the Gospels. Our earnest, our down payment, includes portions of the Pleroma, the all things that's part of the mystery that God gave Christ so he could do his next assignment, which is sit thou on my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. And we are his body, so we assist him in that assignment. That's what Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22 says, put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So we work for our Lord Christ Jesus, who's the head of the body. All right? So in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, <laughs> Jesus said, you shall be witnesses unto me. There's, there's a textual correction in Stephen's text. Unto me shouldn't be the dative case. It should be genitive. Of me. You are my witnesses. You know, Wayne shared that the witness of the Spirit is evidence that's presented by means of one of the manifestations or another of the Spirit. So the works that Jesus did were done by the manifestations of the Spirit. See, in John 5, he said, I have a greater witness than they have of John for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, they bear witness of me that the Father has sent me, and the Father himself which has sent me, he hath borne witness of me. So, the, the bare witness was the works that came by the manifestations of the Spirit that he wrought. See? And Jesus in Acts 1 said, they shall all be witnesses. Now normally, when one is a witness of something, it's past tense. You were a witness. But this is future. So it's not talking about them being witnesses of Jesus being the Messiah, like most infer. No, they were going to be his witnesses and this is in the same breath as receiving power lambano receiving in the manifestation the holy spirit so what on what happened on pentecost was a witness they were his witnesses of the greater power that god poured out to his son greater power enables us to do greater works by means of the manifestations of the spirit so john 14 putting this together John 14, verse 12, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say to you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. So we get everything Jesus had in the Gospels. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. That's part of the plain Roma. So our earnest includes everything that Jesus had in the fourth administration plus. Wow. <laughs> that's a chapter and verse, please. See? That's a, that's a hallelujah socket to you. <laughs> so, now also, we might as well at this time, since we're talking about the mystery, take care of the administrational category. All right? Uh, those who don't know about the great mystery are prone to to many theological errors. They apply prophecies that are made to the Jews to Christians. For example, they, the Olivet Discourse, they say, is talking about the gathering together. That cannot be, because the gathering together is part of the great mystery, and they get it all mixed up. So these, these things of the Spirit are definitely administrational, okay? Because they, they change with each administration. So even though Jesus couldn't have known the great mystery, yet in the Sermon in the Valley, he declared in John 14, 26, that the Spirit would teach them all things 
And in John 16, he said the Spirit would guide them into all truth. That's the administrational thing. Now, the next square. I know I'm going a little bit long. I hope you don't mind. I'm sort of on a hot streak here. I'd like to finish up, if you don't mind. I went down a few rabbit trails, too. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the next square on the grid deals with categories. All right. The manifestations and the ways of the Spirit are, that's the way that the Spirit is evidenced. And in the Old Testament, there were seven, and they were divided up a bit different, as we saw. In the New Testament, we have nine. And the major difference which affects that is that the Spirit is in us. That's what happened on Pentecost. Jesus said, it'll be, it's with you and it shall be in you. All right? That changed at Pentecost. The fact that it's in us, that has an effect. It's inseparable. It's part of us. And so we have the three inspiration manifestations. And I thought that was really clear that Wayne taught about that, that we have them. They're in us. They, they are part of us. We actually could misuse them. That's why all the instructions are there in 1 Corinthians 14. It's an act of our discretion. Wow. And he went down that rabbit hole about what a privilege. <laughs> that was precious. But, I mean, that's speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy are inspirational. One doesn't need revelation to do those. One could do them as often as they want. Except, of course, worship manifestation should be done in the context of a church setting. Not the building, but the believers in the church. Assembly of two or more, right? And but one could speak in tongues 24-7, you know, if, he, if we didn't have to sleep. Now, of course, there are guidelines about speaking in tongues out loud in public, but you could do it often as, as you want. So that is a consequence of the Spirit being in you. It's inspirational. Now, Antonio wrote me a question asking why the manifestation of believing was not in the list in Isaiah 11. Well, I'm not. they surely did believe in the Old Testament because in Hebrews 11, by faith, by faith, by faith, remember the list. And of course, that word faith, since it's before the day of Pentecost, actually has to believe, be believing, like Galatians says, before faith came. All right? So they believed. They definitely did believe. But I'm still cogitating about the manifestation of believing. It's got to be something spiritual because it's, it's a manifestation. I'm going to talk that over with Wayne, and I'm, I'm, I'm believing that we're going to have an answer by the end of this class, all right? But I'm not ready to pull the trigger on that one yet, so just need to be patient for that one. Uh, but anyway, the spirit of might in the Old Testament is divided into two manifestations in the New Testament, all right? Miracles and healing. And also the two parts of discerning of spirits that were in the Old Testament list in Isaiah 11 are combined into one in 1 Corinthians 12 in the New Testament. The manifestation of discerning spirits still has two parts, like it did in the Old Testament. The nomenclature in the Old Testament and the New Testament are labels. God energizes the spirit according to the entire spectrum of ways. All right? And the entire spectrum is the manifestation of the Spirit. I think that explains why 1 Corinthians 12, 7 is singular. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. God energizes the entire spectrum. And we've just divided the spectrum into different parts in our terminology in the Old Testament and in the New. I think that's the explanation. There were seven evidences in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there are nine. All right? Jesus said in John 15, 26, The Spirit shall testify of me, and you shall bear witness of me. Well, the bearing witness is via the manifestations. See? So that he was talking about the manifestations. He was talking about this category. The next square I'm going to do is exclusive and inclusive. 
Wayne taught about the spirit being poured out on all flesh, young and old, male and female, bond and free. All the societal limitations of age and gender and caste were nullified, including women in ministry. That opened up. That's something inclusive. I mean, there's nothing women cannot do in Christ. Holy Spirit is not male or female. Also, the caste system was broken. A slave, Onesimus, was now a brother in Christ to his master, Philemon. So we need to put inclusive in that square under the fifth administration. Now this has consequences because now since every believer has the spirit, I think that the modern conception of the office of a prophet has changed. I mean, it needs to change anyway because of the confusion over what genuine prophecy is. Most people think prophecy is fortune-telling, you know, telling the future. No, it's mainly forth-telling, F-O-R-T-H-telling. It's not F-O-R-E-telling primarily. It's only a small part of it. Prophets speak for God much more than they tell the future. But the inclusive and exclusive effect of, on this was, before Pentecost, only a few people had the Spirit upon them. So, if believers wanted to find out what to do, they'd have to seek prophets out and counsel with them to find out what the will of God was. And that's what that Spirit of counsel was in Isaiah 11. But now, since everybody has the Spirit that's born again, God can tell every believer what to do. And he does. God's big enough to get that to you one way or the other. No matter how mature you are, <laughs> you know what God wants you to do if you think about it. And hence, prophets ought not to go around and tell everybody what to do. Instead, they should counsel with folks to draw out what God has already been telling them all along. <laughs> I mean, in the Old Testament, if you were a prophet, you didn't get three strikes. You only got one. All right? And if what you said didn't come to pass, you were out. <laughs> so you better be right if you're a prophet. And when you represent God and give someone else counsel, you better be right. I mean, people now who think they're prophets, they're going around telling everybody, God told me to tell you what to do. Well, they, in the least, are anachronistic. They're misplaced in time. And in the worst case, they're busybodies, actually. <laughs> and if you don't like that, tell them you heard it from me. <laughs> we represent God. A great door opened wide on Pentecost. It was an inclusive door. Like Wayne read, Acts 4.33, with great power, gave the apostles witness, witness, proof via the manifestations of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Well, what did he get when he raised from among the dead? All that power, see? It proved everything. It was the linchpin of all time. And great grace was upon them all. All right, they just didn't give testimony. They gave evidence, manifestations, great power. See, that was by the manifestations of the Spirit. And it says great grace was upon them. Well, that can't be that the people sinned a lot and were forgiven. <laughs> I mean, being strong in the grace is, in Timothy is not that. <laughs> this is not vertical grace. It was horizontal grace, like 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. The grace given to them that they were to be good stewards of. Their ministries that they received by grace and which were to be put into action horizontally with the same grace we were with God graced them with. See, that's the great grace. So in other words, great grace was upon them all. In that group of all those believers in Acts 4, well, there was evangelists popping up here and pastors popping up there and miracle workers here and merciful ones there. All 14 ministries. Boom, 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 boom. Great grace was upon them all. Their ministries were in full bloom. Wow. Not just the apostles. See, that was the turning point in the church. See? <laughs> and I think that because there are so many variations... And because every believer is uniquely created in Christ Jesus unto good works, I believe that was the reason 
for the change of the spirit of might, one category, developed into two in the New Testament, miracles and gifts of healing, because there's so many believers that can do it all the different ways. Wow. So I think they gain increased status as separate manifestations of the Spirit by virtue of the wide variety of miracles and healings which could be wrought by a much greater number of believers and in more diverse ways. So you could also write diverse ministries there under inclusive, exclusive. And Jesus' mention of this category in the Sermon in the Valley was John fourteen six. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everyone who believes on me gets born of the Spirit. That's inclusive, right? Next category is transformational. I just have a couple more pages here in my notes. Transformational. Could they speak in tongues in the Old Testament? No. Were there any manifestations that they could do 24-7 in the Old Testament? No. Only when God energized it. Well, that's a significant difference between then and now, right? See, we have to edify our spirit. We have to build up our spirit, like it says in Jude 20 or Ephesians 3, 6. But in the Old Testament, they had no constant means to do so. So their spirit came fully, fully charged. There was no way to build it up. See, Saul was changed to another man. Balaam, one moment he was off the bandwagon wishing he could earn a payment by cursing Israel, and the next moment he's blessing them via the Spirit. Well, can you do miracles 24-7? No. Can you receive revelation 24-7? No. Well, what can you do whenever you want at your discretion? Speak in tongues. You can do it out loud when appropriate, silently, mentally, anytime. Paul wrote him, he spoke in tongues more than they all. And he wrote, forbid not to speak in tongues. So folks who don't want to speak in tongues, bless them. They're, they're still born again, all right? But they're trying to do it the hard way, <laughs> all right? God gives grace, but they're asking him to make an exception to the rule, see? So in that transformative box, I want you to write needs edification, all right, the spirit needs edification. So we have to build it up. But there's something else that's there. Matthew 3:11. John the Baptist said, I indeed baptize you with water, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he shall burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Well, what is it talking about? What's on the other side of that fire? Well, 1 Corinthians 3, you're familiar with the passage that every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it's going to be revealed by fire what, what try every man's work of what sort it is. And if any man's work abides which he has built on it, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So what's on the other side of that fire? The tares are going to be burnt. The trees will be hewn down and cast into the fire. The chaff, like it talked about, will be in the fire. And what's on the other side? First Peter 1 Peter 1.7 says, says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So the fire is going to burn up everything wrong and worldly. And afterward, on the other side of the fire, will be glory and holiness and purity. That's what the fire will ultimately do. But, scripture said that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. Holy Spirit and fire. That's a hendiades. It's a two for one figure. Now, I got to clear something up because I believe I may have misspoke in an earlier teaching. 
and I checked my notes. I couldn't find exactly where I said it, so it must have been when I was on a rabbit trail. <laughs> I spoke on a tangent, and I goofed. Uh, um, I believe I told you something incorrect about Hendiades. I remember that I said that when you combine the two, you take the first term and make it into the adjective. Well, I double-checked Bollinger, and it's actually the second term. I'm sorry. I missed that. But, I mean, it's better if, it, if if I catch my own missteps instead of somebody else catching it for me. <laughs> At least it's less embarrassing. So, with the Holy Spirit and fire, it should be the fiery Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the handout from Bollinger's explanation so you'll get the, the rest of the details. So, Jesus baptizes with the fiery Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Well, what's fire do? Fire purifies. It refines. It get, gets rid of impurities. And there was fire on the day of Pentecost. What was the fire for? The fire was transformational. That's what happens when we manifest the Spirit. It's transformational. What happens when you manifest the Spirit on a consistent basis? You get the fruit of the Spirit in your life. That's transformational. You see how that fits in that square? Wow. That's one of the benefits of speaking in tongues. It's transformational. So right there in transformational, you can write in the grid, fire purifies. See? that's Now, the difference between the Old Testament and the New is that we have to build up our spirit so our transformational is gradual. The more we speak in tongues, the more we manifest, the more the fruit that we get. All right? And we have to edify our spirit and build it up. That's that Christ being formed in you, as I taught in the As He Is, chapter 3, the One Lord of Original Christianity class. In the Sermon in the Valley, what Jesus refers to this is in John 16, verse 8. Jesus predicted that the Spirit would reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And in John 15, verse 1 through 5, he said, Abide in me, and you'll bring forth much fruit. So that's this transformational part of the Spirit. Also, he called the Spirit the paraclete. I think comforter is an indistinct translation. Motivator would be better. Well, what are we motivated to do? Do God's will, <laughs> that'll kindle you. That's an aspect of the Spirit that we can believe for. Finally, got one square left. I hope you don't mind. I've gone long here, but the last square is the communicable one. God took the Spirit that was upon Moses and gave it to the 70. Also, Jesus gave the apostles power to cast out devils and to heal. All right. Also, for the initial contacts, free will was in play. God called to them, and they answered by free will. So what are we going to put in that square? Well, God calls us, and we answer by our free will. So you can put in God calls and free will, all right? 1 Timothy 1.9 is an example of that. There's several other verses. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But... Is there anything else communicable that fits with this pattern? See, this grid analysis has drawn out, it's got us to think in different ways. Well, is there something else that's communicable with the New Testament spirit that you and I have? Well, who filled you? Ephesians 1.23 says Christ fills all things in all believers. All right? Colossians 2.10 declares we're completely, completely, absolutely complete in him. All right? Colossians 1.27 says we have Christ in us. Well, what is that? Acts 2.33 said that he, Jesus, shed forth, poured out what came on Pentecost. All right, of course, God gave it to him, and, and we partake of it. So is there something else communicable with the spirit that we have? Look at Romans. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 9. It says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from among the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from among the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. Well, the Spirit of Christ is there in the text and explains it in the next verse, if Christ be in you. So, the Spirit of Christ, Christ is in us. The Spirit of Christ, Christ is in us. Here's another one, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Well, what does this quicken, quicken make alive? We trace back our soul life to Adam. We trace back our spiritual life to Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 15. Just a couple more verses here. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, and yea, will rejoice, for I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of Jesus Christ supplied him. Of course, now Jesus said he doesn't do anything of himself. It's, he did God's will always. So Jesus did it by the power of God. See? Now, what did Jesus predict in the Sermon in the Valley that fits this communicable nature? John 16, verse 14. Jesus said, He shall glorify me, for he, the Spirit, shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he, it, the Spirit, shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. See, now I shall show it to you, unto you is not quite what I'm getting at, but it's along the same lines. But there are more hints throughout the Sermon in the Valley that together give us the picture. Jesus said in John 14, 18, I won't leave you comfortless. I will come to you. In John 14, 26, he said, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. In John 14, 28, he said, You've heard how I said to you, I go away and come again to you. In John 15, 1, he said, I am the true vine. In John 16, 7, he said, If I go not away, Comforter will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. So, I think that in this communicable square, we can write, we get what Christ has in that square. So, just like God took from the Spirit that was upon Moses and gave it to the 70, there is a connection between what God gave Jesus and what we have. We are complete in him. He fills all in all. God shed it forth to us via Christ. We have the earnest of the Spirit. And beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Bless you.